beautiful morning you've uh, presented to us, God. That, Lord, you would uh, share your creation and the beauty of it with us, Father. We're so thankful for the blessings this week. Uh, Lord, you don't just see to our needs, God. You exceed those needs, and we are thankful. But we do lift those up, Father, that are struggling uh, still from the storm or just life in general, God. And we just pray your hand upon them, Lord. You use us if we know of a situation that we can reach out and we can show the love of Christ to those in need. And, Father, as uh, we go into our time of worship, Lord, we just invite you into this house, Lord. Just fill this place with your Holy Spirit. God, speak to each one of us that, Lord, when we leave, we can say it was good to be in the house of the Lord today. Father, just uh, be with Jonathan as he brings the words, Lord. And uh, we're so thankful that you watched over him during his time away and you brought him safely home, Lord. And we're just anxious to hear about the mission trip uh, in the next few weeks. And again, thank you for bringing him back home and speak to him today. Be with our music, our song, Lord, as we just sing praises to you, God. As we go into this time of worship, may we bring you honor and glory and just say we love you and we need you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Are you ready to worship the Lord today? Amen. Let's stand together and sing Christ our hope in life and death.
is only by His grace. Grace alone, which God supplies, strength unknown, He will provide. Christ in us, our cornerstone, we will go forth in grace alone. supplies strength to know he will provide Christ in us our cornerstone we will go forth in grace alone Amen. You may be seated. You know all through God's word we hear about who Jesus really, really is. A lot of people didn't understand Jesus. And so we see it often in the scriptures. In uh, Matthew 16, uh, when Jesus came to his disciples, and he says, who do the people say that I am? And so he finally, he said, but who do you guys say that I am? And Simon Peter says this in verse 16. Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And then we see in chapter 17, at the transfiguration, again, God himself testifies as to who Jesus is. He says, this is my son whom I love, with, who, with him I am well pleased. Listen to him. This choir piece today tells us exactly about who Jesus really is. I walk by the tomb of Buddha, looked inside, saw his bones, traveled on to see Mohammed, still wrapped up in his grave. Then I turn into a parlor where old Charles left him lay, precious land, God's only honor was no
As the choir comes down, let's stand and greet each other this morning. It's good to be in God's house. Amen.
Let's sing this chorus together. Holy Spirit, thou art welcome in this place. Jesus saved us. Father, uh, we're just so thankful, Lord, to be able to come into your house today. We're so thankful for all who have come, and uh, Lord, I just pray that your Holy Spirit guide and direct in all that takes place here today. I pray, Father, for our pastor. I pray that you speak through him your words this day, and may each and every one of us have open hearts and minds to receive your message. May we all leave here changed lives today. I just pray these things in Jesus' name. And Lord, for our opportunity to give back a portion of your blessings today. We are so blessed in this nation. And I pray that as we give this offering to you today, that you use it in a mighty way to spread the gospel news outside these walls, wherever it may be. We ask these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated.
Good morning, church. How is everyone this morning? Everybody, hopefully everyone had a, had a good weekend, and it is it's so good to, to see all of you again and and to be back here uh, after after my trip. So I, I want to definitely say thank you for for praying and thank you for supporting uh, my trip to Krakow, Poland this year. And thank you for praying and checking in and uh, and loving all my family while I was away. It, that that means a lot uh, to me, knowing that that you guys were supporting uh, us through prayer and through just uh, loving on on my family. So thank you again. And uh, yeah, so so tonight, hopefully, Lord willing, I'll, I'll uh, take our, our time tonight to just share what God has done uh, and is doing in those that faithfully serve um, in Krakow, Poland. So if you'd like to hear more, uh, please come out tonight and, and I'll have some some pictures and just kind of share opportunities to pray, um, and and but you can kind of just hear what's going on there. So again, thank you. Uh, pictures that I saw on Facebook uh, looked like the trunk or treat was successful. So thank you guys for those that participated in and serving our community community uh, through passing out candy and um, and just loving on those uh, of the community. And it, uh, I pray that that homecoming was a blessing as well. Uh, this past Sunday, and so um, as as we kind of move forward and 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 maybe think back a couple weeks ago as well, um, I, I mentioned during our the sermon two weeks ago that we would be talking about the Trinity, right? And and so this morning I want us to look at probably one of the most uh, important, uh, but also confusing. Um, paradoxical, I guess, if you want to say, truth about God, and that is the doctrine of the Trinity, a word that for many, if you spend any time in a, in a Southern Baptist church um, or, or a Christian, evangelical Christian church, a word that you probably have heard, should have, hopefully have heard, uh, and probably to some degree know what the word Trinity is referring to, what it means. Um, but, but, but this morning, I want us to look through Scripture, and I want us to see the beauty, the complexity, of course, and the glory of the triune God. I want us to look at uh, what the Trinity is, biblical evidence for that points to a triune God, and what the roles are of each person in the Trinity. So that's our goal this morning. I want us to, to do that uh, in a way that hopefully by the end of this, if you know what the Trinity is, you'll have some evidence, some scriptural evidence to back that up. Maybe you don't fully understand, and my goal this morning would be to not make it more confusing for you, okay? <laughs> uh, I would like to say that we'll have a better understanding. I do think that there are things that we can learn from Scripture, but to fully comprehend this is is is. Uh, in our finite minds, is very difficult. But sound good? We're ready to roll into God's Word? Well, let's pray. God, thank you so much for this uh, opportunity to be back in, in your house and back in front of these lovely people of Baton Baptist Church. And God, I just pray in the next few moments that you will speak through me, that you will allow us to just even just a little bit more understand who you are, understand how complex and how mysterious in ways, but how very real and direct and personal you are to us. And as we see the Trinity in a way as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, that we will understand the uniqueness that each person plays in our lives but that this does not mean that there are many different gods or anything, but there's simply one God that allows us just to be in awe of who you are. Be with us now as we study your word, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, the, the Trinity, what is the Trinity, or what the Trinity is? Do we, did you know that actually the, the word Trinity is not found in anywhere in the Bible? So, so, so where does this word that we use so commonly and so often, where did it come from? If we think about the original language of, of the Bible, 
the, the Old Testament was majorly, majorly wrote in, in Hebrew uh, with a little bit of Arama- Aramaic in there. Uh, and then the New Testament, it originally was written in Greek. So, so in nowhere does this word Trinity appear. Trinity actually comes from the Latin word Trinitas, which means three. So here you have this Latin word that we use regularly in, in our talking about God in the Trinity that has no place actually in Scripture. So should we use it? And I would say yes, because it does a really good job of trying to describe at least uh, God. And so where did it come from? Well, around 200 A.D., in an attempt to convey the complex mystery found throughout Scripture of how one true God is also equally and separately existing as creator, savior, and sustainer, the early church father, uh, Tertullian, used the word Trinity to describe God. So around 200 A.D., we first see the glimpse of this word Trinity that we use so commonly today. He was trying to use a word to convey the very thing that I want us to look at this morning, and that is this. God exists as one essence with three persons. So, if you, so know this. Again, this whole entire series that we're going to go through uh, and have breaks, of course, through the holidays is, is, is I want us to focus on who God is, who Jesus is, who are we, and what the mission of the church is. And so as we kind of end with the, the last one on who God is, we need to understand that God exists in three separate persons. He's one God. Now, this is, this is so, uh, 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 again, mystical, confusing. Uh, it, is, it is a major paradox in understanding, well, wait a minute, how can you have three but have one? Exactly. So essence, when we think of God exists in one essence, the essence is the basic real and in, in, uh, invariable nature of something. This is the definition of essence. It's the very real, basic, and unchanging nature of of something, so so God exists in one nature. Uh, maybe one way of looking at it is this: freedom is the very essence of our democracy. You can't take away if you take freedom out of our democracy, it would cease to exist, right? And so when we think about God, when we think about existing one essence, you cannot take away the oneness of God. If you do, then He ceases to exist, and not that we can remove who God is or make him not exist anymore, but you can't take away the oneness. Does that make sense? God exists in one essence with three persons. So a self-conscious or rational being. Listen to this prayer about the paradox that is the Trinity. Father, Son, and Spirit, you are beyond our understanding. Thank you for bringing us into your love Love that existed before the world in your three perfect persons. Amen. That is beyond our understanding, yet he brings us into his love and a love that existed equally amongst the Trinity, the triune God, before anything ever existed. That is the God that we serve. Kevin DeYoung writes this, The doctrine of the Trinity is the most important Christian doctrine that most people never think about. It's absolutely essential to our faith, and yet for many Christians, it seems like a very confusing math problem. It seems like something that is very hard to comprehend, that it just doesn't make sense. And I would agree with you, yes. But it is one of the most, if not the most, fundamental, important Christian doctrines in our faith. It separates us. The doctrine of Trinity separates Christianity from every other world religion. Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, Mormonism, Judaism, although the God of the Orthodox Jews is the same God that we worship, their disbelief of Jesus being the Son of God disqualifies them from serving the same God that we serve of the Bible. None of these, none of these, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, Mormonism, and Judaism, acknowledge or embrace God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
We as Christians, we as evangelical Christians believe that God exists in one God but in three separate persons and that separates us from every other religion. That is what is so foundational to when we think about who God is and we think about the Trinity and we think about the New Testament and the Old Testament, we're going to get to that in just a moment, we have to see that God is one but he's also three. If you're taking notes this morning, here are six things to know about the Trinity. Number one, the one true God is triune, triune, or three in one, eternally existing as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One true God existing eternally in three persons. Number two, each one of these three persons is fully God. Make no mistake about it. One is not any less God than the other. Each one of these three persons is fully God. Number three, the three persons share in the one divine nature and thus are equal in essence, glory, and power. Each one are fully God and each one sharing one divine nature, and therefore are equal in essence, glory, and power. Number four, the distinction in roles. Okay, so we have to see that this, this triune God exists in one equal power, but they exist also in the distinction of roles. And we'll get into that just a little bit later. Number five about the Trinity Three persons does not mean three separate gods. Three separate gods does not describe the one true God. Tritheism is a belief in three gods, and each god is an independent, independent person with his own consciousness and determination. That is what tritheism believes, that you have three separate gods that are working together. No, that's not what the Trinity is. That's not who the triune God is. He is not, or they are not, three separate people. Christianity is monotheistic, single. Single, not polytheistic, plural. God exists in three separate persons, but he's one God. And this may be, you know, you may be thinking to yourself this morning like, well, yes, duh. But, but at the same time, we have to also wrestle with this. Like if I'm sharing with someone or I'm, I'm settling on this myself, that doesn't make sense really to me. Of course he would be separate. Of course, if we're going to say that there's three separate persons and then they would be three equally separate their own, that makes sense over here. One true God, that makes sense over here. But how can them both be the same? There's where we differ and our faith comes into play. And one day our faith will become sight and we will see just how that is possible when we look at God in heaven. But we can't dismiss that here today when it is still by faith that we believe these things. The Trinity is not only one person. So we know it's not three persons, but it's not one person. Unitarianism is a system of Christian beliefs that maintain the unipersonality of God, which we cannot speak this morning, excuse me, which rejects the deity of the Son and the Spirit. So you have this belief system over here that's trying to make sense of all this, and they're saying, well, they all are the same um, in, in, in power and, and uh, you know, in, in their nature, but they're three separate people that are working together equally. They're locking arms, okay? That would be when we think of people, this tritheism, okay? It's a Christian belief system that's created to say that, that that somehow this is how it all works out, and it makes sense. 
Then over here you had this Unitarianism that says, no, 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 there's only one true God, and there's only one God, and this unipersonality, that like God has these three different uh, personalities, that it would be, we would call a schizophrenic, right? Like, that's not who God is, okay? He doesn't exist, and at one moment he's acting like the Spirit, and in one moment he's acting like the Son, and in one, one moment he's acting like the Father. No, that's not who God is. They exist equally at all times, and it's one God. These two belief systems were created in an attempt to fully grasp God as one essence in three persons. That's what they're trying to do. Understand, how does all this come about? Listen to me this morning, church. Just because our finite minds cannot fully comprehend how God is only one God but three separate persons does not give man the right to dismiss what the Bible says. Just because we don't fully understand doesn't give us the right to say, well, this can't be true. What we know from Scripture is that there, are, there is evidence and there are places that speak to the separation but the unification of one God. Greg Allison writes this, the Trinity is a mystery, and even the best explanations fall short of reality. In another sense, it's difficult uh, that its difficulty cannot deter the church from affirming what God reveals about his triune essence. The difficulty behind what God's word says and proclaims does not give us the right to dismiss its claims. We have to take this and we have, to, we have to wrestle with it the best we can. We have to meditate on this. We have to ask for wisdom. We have to believe by faith that this is God's word and it is true. This means we should not try to create belief systems to take the mystery out of the Trinity. We try to create things. And, 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 and yes, we, we, we talked about how we create, how God created us to the ability to create things and and, and that's good, but we also try to, if this doesn't make sense, well, I have to figure out. Let me take the mystery out of this. We can't do that with the Trinity. We can't take a system that is, is, is fail-safe and it explains exactly who this infinite God is with our finite minds. It's not possible. We cannot do it. The most difficult thing about the Christian concept of the Trinity is that there is no way to perfectly and completely understand it. Hear me this morning. I'm not standing up here telling you that by the end of this, you're going to fully understand the Trinity because you're not. Because it's not possible. That is the most difficult thing about the Christian concept of Trinity. Yet we must not dismiss the Trinity, nor decide that it is not necessary to learn about, meditate on, and pray for wisdom as we discover and we, and we glean on and we, and we meditate and we pray and we ask for wisdom. All these things about the glorious existence of the nature of God. May we not dismiss that. So that's what the Trinity is. If, you, if you're following along, number two. The doctrine of the Trinity is progress, progressively revealed in Scripture. So if you're taking notes, I'm going to run through, not super fast, but I'm going to go through some, some passages of Scripture starting in the Old Testament, and we're going to try to follow through. So just jot these down, add them, highlight them, go back later if you want to, uh, and, and just follow along as, we, as I try to show you some, some Old Testament and New Testament proofs of the plurality of of God. So in the Old Testament, there's not a full picture of the Trinity, but there's most definitely several passages that show that. So starting in Genesis 1, 26, let us make man in our image after our likeness. I do not think the Bible messes up in the, in, in the way that it uses the words that are in the Bible. Even translations, I believe, if they're, they're uh, you know, biblically-based translations, that, that there's this, this overseeing by God that 
He's not going to allow things to mess up. Where they're supposed to be plural, they're supposed to be plural. When they're supposed to be singular, they're supposed to be singular. This is a place. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Psalm 110, 1 says, The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your, fo- your footstool. Now, he- here's the thing. So if you see there on the screens, you see, maybe you know this, maybe you don't. But the Lord, all capital, says to my Lord, capital L, lowercase letters. That's a, there's, there's something very important about that. That's not a typo. Okay? Lord in all capitals is referring to, is Hebrew, Yahweh. If we, you were to see that in the original language, it would not say Lord, it would say Yahweh. But then at the same time, you see Lord capital L. We know from our good growing up in Sunday schools, if it's a capital, it's a pronoun, right? Like, this is a very important one, right? This is referring to not God because it's not all capitals. Well, then who's it referring to? Somebody very important, but not Yahweh. It's referring to God. Jesus himself uses this passage when asked by the Pharisees in Matthew 22, when he is asked who is the son or whose son is the Christ, Jesus makes the argument that he cannot be David's son because David, according to this, calls him Lord. So how then can Jesus be David's son if David is referring to him as Lord? Here's evidence that there's some sort of unique identity with God and there's God the Father Yahweh and then there's this other not David's son Christ but somebody that he refers to as Lord Revelation 19 16 says on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords capital L Lowercase, O-R-D, lowercase, lords. This passage, Revelation 19 and Matthew 22, shows that Psalm 110 is referring to Jesus. Jesus himself even makes claims to this in Matthew 22. Isaiah 6, 8, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Andrew Davis writes, The Lord us clearly has a Trinitarian basis, for the dual question parallels I with us. Only triune God can speak like this. Don't miss these these, these identifying ways of using pronouns to, to refer to I, us, we. These are things, our, that we see in the Old Testament that refer to the plurality of God. As he's speaking sometimes of himself, or people are are talking about him, or to him. Isaiah 48, 16, and now the Lord God has sent me and his spirit. This passage is referring to Jesus, who is the suffering servant and the Redeemer. Isaiah 49, 6 through 7, the Lord says that Israel will be a light for the nations and that his salvation will reach the end of the earth. This will only happen once the Son of God comes as the Redeemer. The Son of God, the second person in the Trinity, God the Son, when he comes. So there's a few, if you're jotting notes, of Old Testament. Let's go to New Testament, because I do believe that the New Testament gives us a more full, clearer picture of the individual persons of the Trinity. Matthew 6, or excuse me, Matthew 3, 16 and 17. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Here we see all three persons of God interacting in their individual divine roles. God the Son, God the Spirit coming down, and God the Father saying, this is my son, who I am well pleased. Don't miss this. 
This is the beauty of the scriptures that we hold in our hands. That we see, even as confusing and, 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 and really honestly, we're unable to understand this fully, but we still see it. The beauty of it right here in the pages of God's word. Matthew 28, 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nation, nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. This was not equal, then why would we baptize them in all three? Here we see the beauty of, again, all three persons of God interacting in their separate, separate but equal roles. 2 Corinthians 13, 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Paul is ending his letter to the church in Corinth and he ends it with this. Grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Understanding there's something beautiful in these words. This verse gives us a glimpse into their separate roles when they're interacting with humanity. We see here that Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Here we see how they interact with humanity. Here's how they interact with creation in just a moment we'll get into. Colossians 1.19, for in him, that is Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Jesus is 100% God and 100% man. There is no, well, yes, we understand that there are passages of Scripture that God, that where Jesus stepped out. He took off his, his full understanding and, and he stepped into clothes of, of humanity, but he did not deplete any of his godliness. He just went and submitted to this role in which he was to play for salvation. Do not miss that. Jesus is 100% God and 100% man. 1 Corinthians 3.16. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? This is one of those that um, that's going to kind of step back into and you guys are, are you're in my youth group and and maybe you're this is you uh now hopefully not but maybe you're working with your kids on this when when we have a conversation or i would have a conversation with a youth or even a kid i would you know i'd say uh you know uh who died on the cross and they'd say god and i'd be like well you're not wrong in one sense but you're also not right. Who lives in our hearts? Jesus does. Well, you're not wrong, but you're not right. Because we got to understand, like, if the answer is God, then sure, we could say, and the triune God, yes. But we see that they play different roles. Jesus, the Son of God, God the Son, is who died on the cross for our sins. God, the Spirit, dwells in our hearts. Okay? Like, I know we sing the little, great little songs, right? But, but we have to understand that there are separate ways of looking at exactly which person of the Trinity done what in interacting with humanity. And we see here, God's Spirit dwells in you okay like the third person of the trinity dwells in us god the father doesn't dwell upon us nor does god the son it is god the spirit and those who have accepted salvation in god the son that we have living inside of us does that make sense first corinthians 12 4 and 6 now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are a variety of service, but the same Lord, that is Jesus. And there are a variety of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all and everyone. The beauty of the Trinity played out in scriptures. Number three. 
the roles of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So uh, you kind of got a little bit of that with just a minute ago. So let's, let's walk through that a little bit deeper. So God the Father. So when we think of the triune God, we think of the Trinity, we knowingly or unknowingly know that it's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So how do they interact? What is the purpose? Is it just something cool that differentiates us from other religions? No. There's a purpose behind each one of these three separate persons. So God the Father. The Father is the ultimate source or cause of the universe. He is the ultimate source. He is the one who brings divine revelation. He is the one who enacts salvation and Jesus' human works. God the Father initiates all of these things. His eternal characteristic is fraternity. His eternal characteristic is fatherness. He is our heavenly father. He is the one that is, is making sure everything goes as it's supposed to go. He is the one that is bringing all things to the glory of those who love or those that are in Christ Jesus and who are called by his name. It is God the father and his fatherliness and his paternity that is making sure his children come home. Those that are called according to his purpose. He is the one who sustain, or he is the one who causes everything to happen. God the Son is the agent that the Father uses. We see that beautifully when we see Jesus in the, in the garden and we see him weeping before he goes to the cross and he's praying. He sees, and I can just like somehow I, I just picture him, him pleading with God the Father, saying, Not, you know, please take this cup from me, please, if there's another way. But what does he say? Not my will, but your will be done. When we see Jesus step out of humanity and step in, or step out of eternity and into humanity, he, he, he submits himself to the will of the Father. Jesus, God the Son, is the agent that the Father uses. Jesus brings all things to completion. God the Father, we're going to create Man, in our, after our likeness, Colossians, we see Paul writes about that Jesus is the one that brings everything to, that happens, right? Like we see this, this beautiful plan, execution, okay? Plan, God the Father, execution, God the Son. His eternal characteristic is sonship. But he is not created by the Father, nor does he depend on the Father for his deity. Don't miss that. When we think about what Jesus does, we think about who he is. He is the one who brings all of this to completion. If you have your Bibles, you can look, uh, or it'll be up on the screen, Colossians 1, 15 through 20. Probably one of my favorite passages of Scripture. I love this. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Wait a minute. We said that God is the one that created everything. Yes, he is. God is the one who created everything. God the Father is the one that said this is what we're going to do. God the Son is the one that brought it to happen. See that? We see that God created everything. That's what we believe. God the Father is the one who brought the ultimate source. God the Son is the one that brought it to completion, the one that made it happen. He is the invisible, the image of the invisible God. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. If you don't know, by the way, the him is Jesus here in this passage. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Verse 20. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. God the Son. He is the one 
that is used by God the Father to bring about peace by his blood on the cross. He is the one that brings this to completion. Then God the Spirit, his eternal characteristic is procession, meaning God the Spirit eternally proceeds from the Father and the Son. The indwelling of God the Spirit is our assurance of eternal life. It is our stamp. It is our seal. That when we accept the gift of salvation through God the Son, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is our seal that says we are His. It brings so many other things. There's so many things that the Spirit does, but that is one of the main ones. It's our seal. The one living inside of us that brings about salvation. Greg Allison writes this. Salvation is from and leads to the Trinity. The Father purposed and directed the Son to become incarnate. The Son willingly obeyed the Father and accomplished salvation. The Spirit applies salvation to people's lives. Believers then worship God who is triune. We see the role so, when you're having a conversation with someone and say, God's living in my heart, now maybe you'll know, like, yes, let's be a little more specific about that. And here's why. There's a reason. There's a reason why we should be very specific about who died on the cross, who lives inside of us. Because that's what separates us from all other religions. That's what makes us Christians, that's what makes us evangelicals. That's what gives us the power to go out and to proclaim the gospel to the ends of the earth is because we serve a God who is interacting with all of creation in very specific ways and had a plan to send the Son of God to die for all of humanity, and we need to proclaim it just as it happened because it is that important. So as we begin to wrap up this morning, I know this 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 sermon, this message was not a typical message. I know that it's not one where you take a a passage of scripture and you listen with the three points and there's a beginning and an end. I, I understand that. And I know I threw a lot of verses at you. So if you don't take away anything that I said this morning, take away this. Take away this. Our whole belief system is centered on the doctrine of the Trinity. Our whole entire belief system is centered on the doctrine of the Trinity. It is not possible to believe in the gospel without believing in the doctrine of Trinity. It's not possible for you to have a relationship with God the Son if we do not believe that there, that, that God is a triune God existing in one essence in three separate persons. The very essence of the gospel displays the beauty of the Trinity working together out of love for mankind to bring redemption. Again, the end of Colossians chapter 1, 15 through 20. Verse 19 and 20. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him, what? To reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace. Making peace with who? What is there that needs to be peace made for? It is our sin and our our separation from a holy, righteous God. And there needs to be peace made. And that peace was made by the blood of his own on the cross. That is how we have peace with God Because God the Son stepped out of eternity, stepped into humanity, and took our place on the cross. Now we can have a relationship with him. So if you don't remember anything about this, I hope you do, or maybe it piques your interest for more. Know that our belief system relies on a triune God. One God three persons. Let us pray. God, I thank you so much for this morning. God, as we continue to to proclaim and to worship, to learn about, to be in awe of, 
God, I just pray that we will see you for who you truly are. They will see you as three separate persons, but one God. That you exist in one essence, that there is God. When we think about Old Testament, we think about a fire, a, 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 a fire, a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. We think about all these things in the Old Testament. We see the the the, um, the throne of God. We see the temple. We see the holy of holies. We see the ark of the covenant. We see all these things that just that just show us how 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 beautiful and how holy you are. Yet even at times we see how unreachable you are. But then we get to see the beauty of the three persons that were. And we have in the New Testament, we see the, the inner workings of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And interacting with humanity in a way that allows us to have a relationship with God. That when the Son of God stepped out of eternity and into humanity, we see that when he died on the cross for us, the veil was torn. The thing that separated man from God, that separated us, a, a, a sinful, just wicked humanity and a holy, righteous God, the separation was completely removed on the cross. God, I pray that maybe there's one here this morning that doesn't know you as their personal Lord and Savior, that they don't know what it's like to have a relationship with God the Father through the gift of salvation given by the God the Son. They don't know what it's like to have the Spirit living inside of them, giving them the assurance of hope, giving them the assurance of salvation I pray that they'll come down this morning. God, I pray that you will work in a way that only you can work. God, I pray that the, the Spirit of God will, will convict, will move, and bring in people that you're drawing to yourself. May you be glorified in the next few moments as we finish today. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.